coming to the moot now in his second talk where sarvesh tiwari attempts to account for his claims he is trying to backtrack and soft pedal saying i didn't say anything against poor and i just talked about the jihadis in ina actually it wouldn't matter if he criticized any character but he makes some pretty outrageous claims for which he gives scant or no evidence apart from these latest videos he has put out an elaborate screed against subhash pose in a set of five articles he has been constantly tweeting these defamatory claims and it is not that he has not been countered with correct facts but he chooses to ignore these and that's why this air of honest free assessment of history that he assumes is disingenuous i'll show you a few samples where he makes these blatantly false assertions in one tweet he says sardar patel threatened to sue subhash and sharad pose for fraud in forging a will of his brother allegedly bequeathing his wealth to the left wing causes of bose brothers bose brothers settled with sardar patel out of court then he says subhash pose and brother produced a will in which vithal bhai bequeathed property to leftists sardar patel sued bose for 420 this is the language he is using for subhash chandra bose they settled and at another place he says few know sardar patel had sued bose brothers subhash and sharath in a property case and won sardar's agraj vithal bhai was a trade unionist wonder where he gets that from because it is not true who died in europe in company of subhash in a shoddy will all his property he goes on on these lines and this tweet is from 2030 so he has been on this trip to run down the character of subhash pose for quite some time now and high time it's called out now the facts of the case first of all neither was there a forgery or fraud nor had vallabh bhai threatened a suit and nor was it settled out of court after this will of vithal bhai came to light Vala Bhai started cavilling about it. Why was it signed only by Bengalis and not some Gujaratis who were also with him? Where was the original? Why is the doctor's sign missing? Though this was not strictly required since it was not a deathbed will. The will was almost uh, three weeks before Vital Bhai's death. After this inquisition and innuendos from Vala Bhai had gone on for some time in letters. It was Subhash Bose who, in September 1934, submitted the original will to Bombay High Court and filed what's called a probate petition. That's the legal process by which the validity of a will is determined. And please note this point: the petition was granted. What does that mean? The will was established as genuine in a court of law, and Vallabh Bhai was directed to send the proceeds to Subhash Bose. which incidentally was specified as 3/4 and not all of the property as tiwari is claiming now patel started acting up he refused to comply saying that there had to be an agreement on the interpretation of the will so he did not challenge the genuineness of the will he was contending on its language and why jealousy subhash pose had by now risen tremendously in fame so much so that even gandhi was compelled to propose his name for congress president at the haripura session in february 1938 this was bitterly proposed by vallabh bhai at that time and in 1939 when bose sought re-election again vallabh bhai opposed him and threatened to use his clout with the congress working committee to neutralize him patel was all through the cunning politician and had this hostility towards uh, towards subhash chandra bose now was vithal bhai's will altogether out of the way not really before him there was chitranjan das who also willed his entire property for the nation in spite of having a family they were both fierce swarajists this term i'll explain later but basically they were uncompromising nationalists devoted to the nation Vallabh bhai in contrast was a devout gandhian and that the reason for estrangement between the two brothers at the tripuri session later that year when bose trumped gandhi's candidate 
Pattavi Sita Ramaya to the post of Congress President in April 1939. It was Patel who manipulated the working committee making 12 of the 15 members resign and forced Bose's ouster. But he was not satisfied with this. To assail Bose further, he approached the court, this time to have the will of his deceased brother invalidated through Govardhan Das Patel, one of the Gujaratis who was with uh, Vithalbhai in his last days. This was in September 1939, full five years after the will had been attested as genuine. It was at this time that uh, Sharad Bose came to represent his brother. And this plea by Patel was again not on the will's genuineness but entirely a technicality. The appeal was filed under sections 138 and 139, which are the Indian Succession Acts and not 420 as Tiwari's claims. It was contested by Sharad Bose under section 2, which is the Charitable Endowments Act. To cut a long story short, the will was disallowed due to unclear language as to the will's purpose. In this situation, the only entity the court could hand over the property to was the family. So, Patel didn't exactly win the case. He used legal artifice to claim the property and disregarded his brother's time wish. The judgment is there on India Kanun for those of you who wish to look it up. So, the only fraud here is Tiwari's tweets. Let us take a look at another tweet by Sarvesh Tiwari. He says here, Subhash Bose did not establish INA. It was established by General Mohan Singh and Raj Bihari Bose. He only took over. He also did not establish Azad Hind earlier. It was established by Muhammad Iqbal Shedai. He took over from Shedai his force or duplicated. He did establish forward block though. This last line is the red herring. He constantly insinuates communist leanings against Bose. Sarvesh Tiwari really has this talent of packing in a bunch of lies in a 300 character tweet. But to begin, in one of his articles targeting Subhash Bose, Tiwari is very peeved that Hindu Mahasabha is named before Muslim League mentioned together as communal parties by Bose, according to him every time. First of all, this is wrong because there are, there are several places where Bose has mentioned Muslim League uh, before Mahasabha and the Akalis, which is also mentioned among communal parties. And often he mentions only Muslim Leagues, which is most times. But notice in this tweet, Tiwari mentions the name of Rashpihari Bose, who conceived a nationalist army and worked towards its realization right from the military rise of Japan in 1937 after the name of Captain Mohan Singh, who as a POW in Malaya was converted to the idea later in 1942 by the persuasion of a Japanese intelligence officer, Major Fujiwara Iwachi. He was made a general by Rajpehari Bose. Let's look at the facts to nail this bluff. When war between Great Britain and Japan seemed imminent, Rajpehari Bose, through his long-term associate and protector, Mitsuru Toyama, the Japanese Pan-Asianist leader, initiated contact with the General Staff Headquarters of Japan and held discussions with its Military Affairs Bureau to concretize plans of a military mobilization of Indians against British stranglehold with Japanese assistance. Within the scope of what was known as Japan's Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, a grand plan, plan of Pan-Asian Brotherhood. Indians were not initially included in this scheme, but Raj Behari's engagement uh, with the Japanese seems to have borne fruit. And soon after this, intelligence units were formed for South Asian operations. And in October, Fujiwara Iwaichi's unit, known as Fujiwara Kikan, was tasked with organizing an Indian independence army. And on February 17, 1942, at Farah Park, Singapore, in his first address to the Indian POWs gathered there, Fujiwara formally announced that the Indian soldiers were not being considered POWs but friends and specifically referred to them as the Peoples of East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. 
Now, building of an organized armed resistance had been in discussion for long, since World War I in fact, in meetings of the Indian Independence League, an association of Southeast Asian Indian communities. It was attended by revolutionary groups like Anushilan and Gadar. It is talked about in exchanges with revolutionaries in India, notably uh, Sachindranath Sanyal and V. D. Savarkar. In December 1941, Rajpehari was convened a huge meeting in Tokyo to bring together the Japanese Indian community on this issue as also the revolutionaries. It was attended by Satyanand Puri, Free Monastic Prafulla Sen of Anushilan and Sardar Pritham Singh of Gadar. So, all this was going on. Subhash Bose had been in touch with Raj Bihari Bose all through, as also directly with the Japanese representative since 1937-38. Raj Bihari had been directly asking Subhash Bose to come to Japan to take over the movement and also communicate it through other revolutionaries like Jatin Lochan Mitra, Vidi Savarkar and Harikuma Chakravarti to send Subhash Bose to Japan for this purpose. Before Mohan Singh of 14th Punjab landed as a POW in Japanese hands around mid-December 1941 after the Battle of Jitra during the Malayan campaign, Pritam Singh, who had been a close associate of Raj Bihari since early 1920s, was already in Malaya working with Major Fujiwara. Fujiwara then started working on Mohan Singh, trying to impress on him the worthiness of the cause and the feasibility of building an independence army to fight alongside the Japanese against the British, because they wanted someone with military experience to mobilize the soldiers. And this took time. Mohan Singh was initially reluctant which again is typical of a military man. It is not easy to just break the oath of allegiance without considering the moral dimension. Eventually, he did. He was convinced, especially after speaking to Pritam Singh. His real work began in February 1942, after Singapore fell to the Japanese, along with a significant number of Indian POWs, around 42,000 in number, who were handed over to him by Major Fujiwara in that uh, gathering held at Faro Park, Singapore. Thereafter, his activities consisted of trying to motivate the officers and men for the cause, persuading them to join the independence army. But there was still no structure or organization of an army. There were not even drills for the men who enlisted. In fact, they were put to work on the construction of Tenga airfield and railroads at various other places. Groups of POWs were sent to work in Kuala Lumpur, Siramban and camps in Thailand. Indian National Army uh, came into existence in September 1942 under the auspices of the Indian Independence League headed by Raj Bihari Bose. It was at this time that Mohan Singh was elevated in rank and appointed General Officer Commanding of Indian National Army. So fact of the matter is he did not form an army. Another point here. In his article, Tiwari claims Bose would later name a regiment in INA as Azad Regiment in honor not of Chandra Shekhar Azad, lest one thought so, but of the Maulana Azad, no Ashfaq nor Azimullah. He means the revolutionary and the 1857 freedom fighter. Now, this is amusing. On one hand, he touts revolutionaries as the true patriots and thinks that divisions of INA should have been named after them. But Vallabhai Patel, who publicly denounced the revolutionaries as a bunch of hotheads messing with things they have no business in. He even colluded with Gandhi and Nehru to suppress the naval mutiny. He suddenly becomes very credible for Sarvesh Tiwari in case of the little by will because it is more important to spite Subhash Bose. There is another thing. How can Sarvesh Tiwari predict which side Ashwakullah or Azimullah would have swung had they been present in the years before partition? Maybe they would have chosen Pakistan. Ashwakullah used to assiduously read the Quran in jail. If the case is against Islamism, any Muslim can turn out to be a jihadi tomorrow. Maulana Shaukat Ali of the Khilafat fame was associated with the revolutionaries. He used to supply arms to Anushilan. 
Let me read out a quote. People talk sometimes of the need of the Muslims joining hands with the Hindus because some incidents in contemporary history have not been exactly to their liking. Soft-headed and some self-advertising folk have gone about proclaiming that Muslims should join the Congress because the government had revoked the partition of Bengal, because Persia and Turkey are in trouble. We are simply amused at this irresponsible fatuity. But when a responsible body like the London branch of the All India Muslim League talks of closer cooperation between the Hindus and Muslims because the Muslims of Tripoli and Persia have been the victims of European aggressions, we realize for the first time that even sane and level-headed men can run off at a tangent and confuse the issues. What has the Muslim situation abroad to do with the conditions of the Indian Muslims? Have the questions that really divide the two communities lost their force and meaning? If not, then the problem remains exactly where it was at any time in recent Indian history. Board of arbitration, peace syndicates and solemn pacts about cows cannot solve it any more than we can by a spell of occult words control the winds and the tides. The communal sentiment and temper must change and interests must grow identical before the Hindus and Muslims can be welded into a united nationality. Sounds like a very level-headed, broad-minded, nationalist Indian leader, isn't it? These words come from Molana Muhammad Ali Johar, leader of the Khilafat movement, written some years before he took up cudgels for the caliphate in India. This is what happens when courts are taken in isolation. Anyways, back to facts. During March to April 1942, Indian Independence League conferences were held to bring all representative organizations of Indians in South Asia under one banner during which the formal motion was passed to raise an army under it for Indian independence. These conferences were called the Azad Bharat Sabhas. So the word Azad was in circulation at that time. Azad Brigade was formed when the first Indian National Army took shape in September 1942. It was named number one Hind Field Force. So the word Hind for this independence, Indian Independence Army was also there. It was organized into three brigades, Gandhi Brigade, Nehru Brigade and Azad Brigade. So the name Azad Brigade existed at least 10 months before Subhash Bose even took over the command of INA in July 1943. Also Hindustani was drilled in along with the written English communication at this stage. But why were the brigades named after Congress leaders? For this, we have to look at another set of events which came to be known as the Bidadari Resolutions. Now, after abandoning their pledge to the British Indian Army, the Indian soldiers who were asked to enlist for INA wanted the assurance that they were indeed going to fight for India and not becoming pawns in turn of the Japanese. There was significant uh, apprehension and suspicion uh, against the Japanese. Also, while the British at this time had launched an intense propaganda among the Indian public against the action Axis nations. The excesses uh, committed by the Japanese on the Chinese were reported in gory details and greatly exaggerated. Within British Indian Army, intense propaganda and indoctrination was carried out, defaming the Indian POWs, portrayed as renegades who had betrayed their motherland. They were dubbed JIFs, short for Japanese inspired fifth columnists and portrayed as unprincipled roots. The effects of this propaganda we will have a look at later. Indian leaders got foolishly taken in by it and started issuing denunciatory statements against the Japanese and the Axis powers, pledging support to the anti-fascist allies which started playing on the minds of captured Indian soldiers. And Raj Behari Bose had come down strongly on Indian leaders for this stupidity. We find Subhash Bose's broadcasts from Germany regularly advising listeners to avoid making the fatal mistake of believing in the Allied propaganda offensive in India 
or even uh, the one disseminated by the Indian National Congress, which he warned were just voices coming through the channels of British propaganda. Anand Mohan Sahib, who was the was with Indian Independence League that time, he wrote on the mischievous propaganda now being carried on in India to misrepresent Japan there. And he criticized the naivete of Indian leaders that while some in India were advocating a boycott of Japanese goods, this only gave comfort to Britain. Indians should recognize that it was Englishmen who were instigating Chinese hostility to Japan. He had also uh, written to Nehru and urged Congress leaders to maintain neutrality in the Sino-Japanese conflict. Mohan Singh at this time went about his errand, getting the Indian POWs to join, not giving fiery speeches on patriotism to the soldiers. He was holding talks with the Indian officers, trying to coax them. If they joined, the soldiers would join automatically. And it is important to know what was going on in their minds, which becomes clear when you read their personal accounts. They wanted to have clarity on who and what they would be fighting for. By learning it, for learning it, if you are in India, then who are the league? Second, order is the order. These Malayan and Singaporean Indian are the same. Or the Japanese. So, what is Indian independence? Ka kya? How would they know that they were not being manipulated by groups with interests abroad? So, two things of utmost importance to military men allegiance and the chain of command. We will revisit this scene at the POW camp when we look at the INA trials. So, the officers kept quizzing Mohan Singh on the Japanese motives, and Mohan Singh all the while was trying to keep them interested. But these things were playing on his mind too. In his very first meeting with Fujiwara, Mohan Singh had inquired, when was Subhash Bose coming? This was the proposal that the regional Indian Independence League delegates had taken to the first conference in Tokyo in March 1942. And this was what Colonel Shah Nawaz had said to the Japanese intelligence chief that there was only one man outside India who could start a real INA. So, Subhash Bose's taking over INA was set course all through with or without Mohan Singh. Being one of the tallest leaders that time, seen as equal to Gandhi, having him as commander of the independence army was a clear signal that they were going to fight for their country. But meanwhile, so that he could start off, Mohan Singh convened a meeting of the officers. in April 1942 in Vidadari, the biggest POW camp in Singapore, whereby they framed a set of resolutions on the broad principles of the independence army and an agreement that the in army would go into action only when the Congress and the people of India asked it to. This was obviously added just to quieten the soldiers angst because there is no way Congress or the people of India could send them directions. But this was basically the reason the brigades were named after Congress leaders, to reiterate that they would be fighting only for India and not along Javanese aims. After this, on May 9th, 1942, recruitment for INA started. Eventually, uh, when organization of the Independence Army began, even their armbands were embroidered with the Congress flag along with the letters INA. Until the Burma campaign, which went on till February 1944, INA used the Swaraj flag of the Indian National Congress. In June 1942, at Bangkok, the resolution was formally adopted to invite Subhash Chandra Bose to take over the League as President and the command of the Indian National Army. An all-embracing Indian Independence League was constituted with a Council of Action on top and under it a committee of representatives of Indians in South Asia and the Indian National Army subordinate to this body and therefore in control of the civilian structure. This seems to have been disagreeable to Mohan Singh, though he was made a member of the Council of Action. Mohan Singh was impatient 
inexperienced and did not have the personality and maturity to deal with the Japanese. Indian Independence League wanted to wait till a firm commitment could be elicited from the Japanese on some vital issues, the official status of INA and the assurance that they would be used only in the Indian frontier, the status of Indian nation treated as equal allies instead of dependent subjects. The Japanese on the other hand were intent on building intelligence, surveillance and sabotage units for penetrating the enemy lines. But all Mohan Singh could think of was launching into a campaign at the Burma-India border, irrespective of military preparedness. He had an inflated estimation of INA and himself and had no realistic idea about the theatre of war and strategy. The trust deficit intensified when Fujiwara was sent to a different assignment and in his place under Colonel Iwakuro Hideo, a new intelligence unit was put in place. Mohan Singh started thereafter overstepping his authority, bypassing the Indian Independence League and acting on his own accord, which could have jeopardized the entire effort. So ultimately, he was dismissed and put under arrest on December 29, 1942. With this, the first Indian National Army stood dissolved and ceased to exist as a functional entity. Thereafter, in February 1943, after meeting with military officers and Indian NCOs, non-commissioned officers, Raj Bihari Bose reconstituted INA, this time under his own control. A committee worked on reorganization and in April, a new organization named Directorate of Military Bureau of Indian Independence League was established under Lieutenant Colonel J.R. Bosley of 5th Maratha Light Infantry as the director. In July 1943, then Subhash Chandra Bose arrived in Singapore to take over the leadership of Indian Independence League and Indian National Army. So, if at all he took over from someone, it was directly from Raj Bihari Bose or J.R. Bhosle, but not Mohan Singh. After this, INA was organized as number one division with four brigades, Subhash Brigade, Gandhi Brigade, Nehru Brigade and Azad Brigade. So, only one brigade was added after Subhash Bose came, after his name, which he protested furiously. The other names were simply retained. Going to Tiwari's other claims, he claims that Bose cooperated or was forced to cooperate with the Islamist Muhammad Iqbal Shedai and took over his Azad Hind force and used his broadcasting agency. I quote from his article, Bose had to cooperate and compete with Shedai, take his help in settling up his own radio infrastructure, even staff and retained even the name of Shedai's organization Azad Hindustan with a minor abridgment as Azad Hind. These pressures would further force Bose to demonstrate himself as being a fellow traveler of the Islamists. Bose is a fellow traveler of the Islamists, a path not new to him anyways. Tiwari not only does not provide any reference for these wild claims, he appears hopelessly confused about Shedai's Battalion Azad Hindustan raised with the help of the Italians and the Indian Liberation Army which Bose raised with German assistance known as Indische Legion or Legion Freies Indians or the Legion Azad Hind. He also mixes up or deliberately obfuscates Shedai's Radio Himalaya with Bose's Azad Hind radio. Shedai had formed a government in exile known as Azad Hind government, which was a phantom entity for all purposes. The similarity of names Tiwari has used to portray Bose as beholden to Shedai's aims, as having taken over Shedai's radio establishment. Shankar Sharan also, in his vehement defense of Tiwari, repeats the same drivel, though in chaste Hindi. Now the facts. Shedai's Azad Hind government or Radio Himalaya or his battalion Azad Hindustan had absolutely nothing silch to do with Bose's Azad Hind radio and the Centrale Freies Indian or the Free India Center which he established entirely with German assistance along the lines of their mutual agreements. 
within three weeks of his arrival towards end April 1941, he already had the infrastructure and the vast South Asia network which the Germans had put at his disposal along with a detailed propaganda plan including target nations, the stations and frequencies of broadcast worked out directly with Rühler, the head of Rundfunksteller, which is the German radio, directions for which came straight from Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister. Shedai's Radio Himalaya was established uh, around this time, about early 1941, but in Rome. He had no operations in Germany, so there is no question of Bose having taken over his infrastructure or name or staff or anything. So these are plain lies from Tiwari and company. What Bose did do was offer Shedai a position in Azad Hind Radio because he hardly had anyone for the job. But it did not materialize precisely because of the obvious differences in their aims and orientation. ACN Nambiar was eventually called to take over the broadcasting ops. Radio Himalaya, it is said, was run so amateurishly, it never gained the professionalism and popularity and spread of Azadin Radio and simply faded out of relevance. In fact, uh, during Bose's visit to Rome in May 1942, Bose met the Italian Foreign Minister Cagliazzo Ciano and Mussolini himself. And during these meetings, Bose explicitly requested to set up a Free India Centre and Azad Hind Broadcasting Station in Rome, independent of Shedai's activities. Shedai was certainly a rabid British hater. His association was primarily with the Qadar Party. But his leanings and motivations and activities were entirely Islamist. And the reason he was patronized by Rome was consistent with the larger Axis strategy, Germany, Japan and Italy, all of them, to create a wave of pan-Islamism and direct it against the imperial powers, primarily represented by the British-American Allied Coalition. It was their stated policy since World War I in fact, and Italy totally overdid it, holding itself out as the protector of Islam. Mussolini, in his trip to Tripoli, declared himself the sword of Islam, al Saif al-Islam. Tiwari and Shankar Sharan go on at length hyperventilating about these liaisons. But what does all this have to do with Subhash Bose? Tiwari mentions the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, al Haj Amin al Husseini, and the Fakir of Epi or Waziristan. The association with Bose is made only because these two were among 600 guests invited to the Indian Independence Day celebration on January 16, 1943. So what? Aren't Muslim guests from diplomatic circles invited to formal gatherings? They were German state guests at that time, just like Subhash Bose himself. There's no record of Bose ever having interacted with Husseini. Did Bose himself make an agreement with a single Muslim nation or the Palestinian movement? Bose had shared stage with scores of anti-colonial and anti-communist leaders at international conferences organized by the Germans as part of building a wide uh, front against the Allies known as Anti-Colonial International. They were exiled leaders from Central Asia, North Caucasus, Arab states, Baltic states, Maghreb, which is North African countries, from the Palga Ural region, Chechnya, Poland, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, South Africa, Iraq, also Russian Muslim rebels, Afghans, then Irish rebel leaders. Among them were the Arabs and Palestinians too. Bose never had any direct dealing with these. All of these nations had formed their own legions of independence fighters with German help. He names Palestine among 10 other nations in his speeches only in expressing general disgust at the British ploy of tabbing up land and creating conflict. He does not express support for any particular nation 
he was basically referring to the mischief in the covenant of the League of Nations and all the conflicts born out of the Treaty of Versailles. In fact, he shows remarkable perspicacity in the following words. Britain has in other parts of her empire, for instance in Ireland and Palestine, used the religious issue in order to divide the people. She has been utilizing in India for that same purpose not only this issue but other imperial weapons like the imperial princes, depressed classes, etc. The kind of supporting arguments uh, Tiwari uses, Bose wore an Achkan suit in this function instead of a uniform or dhoti kurta, therefore he was appeasing Muslims. I mean, kaha se dhaga kheech ke joda hai? Why would he be in a diplomatic function in a military uniform? His attire would be meant to show Indian identity and dhoti kurta is just not appropriate for such an occasion. Not to mention the freezing temperature in that time of the year in Berlin. Lal Bahadur Shastri nahi gaye the Videsh, Sherwani mein. Aur dhoti se agar Hindu pride dikta to aap jaso ke liye na, Gandhi ka jasa hi thik hai. Tiwari claims that in Bose's speech, the mention of Indian Muslims and Hindus unanimously rejecting the idea of Pakistan is addressed specifically to appease pan-Islamist leaders. That's crazy. How would Hindu-Muslim unity in India please pan-Islamists? It goes totally against their aims. Bose was fiercely opposed to pan-Islamism all through. In fact, after discovering Shaddai's motives, Bose openly attacked him repeatedly in his radio broadcasts for his pan-Islamist leanings and support to the Muslim League. Shaddai and Bose were by all means rivals in getting the support of Italians and the Germans for their cause. And because of Shaddai's hold in the Italian establishment and Italy's overt support uh, to the Islamists and also Subhash Bose's preference for the Germans, he could never build a cooperation with the Italians and neither could Shedai get the Germans here. Leave alone cooperate, they operated in completely different spheres. In fact, Bose snatched the prerogative from Shedai and rescued the cause of Indian independence from being hijacked by Shedai's Islamist agenda. How this happened, we'll see presently. The definite turnaround in German policy to steer clear of Islamist aims and concentrate on anti-colonial movements is recorded in the German Foreign Office Papers of November 1941. The Italians first got onto the idea of forming foreign units uh, from captured POWs when their Supreme Army Command approved the measure in November 1941. Do please keep the dates in mind as I speak. The first of these under the Military Regrouping Center was established in May 1942 called Centro A, consisting of Arabs, Iraqis, Syrians, North Africans and Palestinians. Centro T consisting of rebel Tunisians was formed on July 2nd, 1942 and Centro I, the force raised from Indian POWs captured during the North African campaign was formed on July 15, 1942. Thereafter, the military regrouping center was reorganized in August 1942, following which Battalion Azad Hindustan was created out of Centro I, when? October 23rd, 1942. And when was Bose's Indian Legion created? April to May 1941. And Tiwari ji says, Bose took over Shaddai's Azad Hindustan Battalion. Matlab, bhayankar gar bade in ki chronology mein. Let us look at the timeline of the Indische Legion now. It began with uh, Bose's meeting with the German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop in April 1941, where he had included the point in the agenda of raising an Indian contingent with the Indian POWs. In April itself, he met cavalry officer Walter Harbish, who had already been training an Indian commando unit comprised of Indian civilian volunteers for ops in the northwest frontier of India, 
what those ops were we will see later. In this meeting plans were finalized to build an infantry unit starting with Havix unit. This was the beginning of the initial idea. Though it would still take time to come in battle ready shape. In May 1941, the first batch of Indian soldiers captured by Germans from the Battle of Tobruk, part of the North African campaign, were inducted into uh, this unit. A steady stream of POWs kept pouring in thereafter, especially after the Battle of Ghazala that ended in June 1942. Now, in the meanwhile, in November 1941, in a meeting attended by German and Italian representatives as well as Shirai, the Italians were made to agree on the following. Forming of Indian Legion will be carried out solely by Germany and to send all Indian POWs held by them to Germany. And not only that, in this meeting it was agreed by Italy that and I am quoting from the minutes of the German Foreign Office. It would not be useful to encourage either with propaganda or politically the Pakistan movement, Muslim League and Jinnah, because the program of the Pakistan movement was only an additional factor in the artificial protraction of the disunity of India by the British. They also agreed for all political and propaganda purposes, India and Afghanistan will be treated as one and the carpet was pulled from under Shedai's feet. This is that turnaround in policy that I talked about and it was a direct result of Subhash Bose's firm and purposeful diplomacy. He was this farsighted about the Indian nation's actual destiny as a regional power and historical geographical sphere of influence. In this uh, first round Bose had been absent. Next day, he got a brief uh, from the Germans about the first day's proceedings and uh, thereafter appeared in the meeting on the second day. The joint declaration of Free India by the Axis powers was discussed in the second meeting and this was when the term Azad Hind was uh, formalized. Remember, Shedai's Azad Hindustan is still nowhere in the scene. It was also agreed that the Indian troops would not be part of the war front in Libya. Why? Because Bose did not want Indians to have anything to do with the Islamists cause. So the Germans not only agreed to set up the Indian Legion for Bose, they also got the Italians to agree to Bose's terms. All Indian POWs committed solely for Indian independence. The Germans also agreed not to use the Indian Legion on any other front to serve German war aims. But poor Shedai, he had clamoured for some time to be recognised as the sole representative of Indian independence abroad and the Italians had indulged him long enough. They were themselves reluctant to let go of all Indian POWs, so they sent most POWs but held back a few. Centro I was formed from these men in July 1942, with Shedai as their leader. Meanwhile, in January 1942, the Germans had already made the formal announcement of the formation of the Indian Legion, since they had begun training the POWs much earlier. The singular taking over was when the Indian soldiers uh, of Centro I, which had Sikhs, Marathas, Rajputs, Punjabis, Kurkas, and Muslims refused to recognize Shedai as their leader and to obey the orders of the Italian officers. These men were then transported belatedly to Germany to be inducted in Indische Legion. After this, barely about 250 to 300 men remained who were then re-inducted into Battalion Azad Hindustan when it was formed in October 1942. But alas, even these men mutinied when they were ordered to uh, proceed to the Libyan front and Shedai refused to back down because uh, the Libyan front served the Islamist uh, aim. So just about a month later in November 1942, Shedai's battalion Azad Hindustan was disbanded. Now I can understand 
Pakistan is making pompous claims to exaggerate Shaddai's stature. But what can possibly be the Virat Hindu's motive for propagating their hoax beats me. It would be perhaps pertinent to mention certain comments made during Bose's meeting first and only with Hitler on May 26, 1942. Hitler outlined India's task in rather straightforward manner in a couple of points, saying Indians have to 1. eliminate British influence, 2. be wary of the Soviets, 3. try to come to an agreement with Japan in order to chalk out a strategy for the eastern frontier and lastly internal organization and reconstruction of India, maintaining unity at all costs, preventing the British from partitioning India and weakening it. Hitler was of course talking in the background of the cutting up of Germany after World War I, but it is apparent that the Germans were fully cognizant of British mischief. And Bose's reply to this? Tell His Excellency that I have been in politics all my life and I don't need advice from any side. To his German associate, as quoted by historian Johannes H. Feucht, he remarked that Hitler is the German version of the Fakir of EP, with whom it is practically impossible to discuss any matter logically even for a few minutes. He also addressed his objection on the racist ideas in Mein Kampf directly to Hitler in this meeting, not edgeways but upfront as an agenda point. He had previously criticized Hitler and German racism openly and this had been brought to Hitler's notice before the meeting. The meeting was not really successful since Hitler was not at that time ready to commit to Bose's plans of opening a military front in South Asia. He did eventually, but uh, the meeting put Bose firmly on the course towards Far East. So Bose worked with a lot of people, directly or indirectly, but he did not harbor illusions about any of them. Neither the Fakir of Ipi, nor al Husseini, nor Muslims, and nor would he be pressured or forced to comply or compromise his aims with any of them, not even Hitler. Tiwari tries to mask his intentions as a genuine academic exercise, but is actually entirely polemical. He employs the typical tactic of the leftists, plausible fallacy. It all appears very genuine to those who don't know the background and history of the period, but what he portrays is completely removed from the truth. It is actually malafide. The entire case that he makes against Subhash Bose, he summarizes as follows. Bose thought that without Muslim approval, neither can Swaraj be won and what is more, nor was it worth winning without their support. The onus of Hindu-Muslim unity lied on the shoulder, what's with this English? Lay on the shoulders of the Hindus alone and the Hindus should be willing to make unlimited and extreme sacrifices to that end. Only by adjusting to the Muslim sensibilities and removing their misgivings was it possible to achieve that unity and therefore appeasing Muslims should be made a core and visible part of any program which is what he conscientiously belaboured to do, again that English, belaboured throughout his political career. In his hostility to Hindutva also he was quite virulent just like the other Marxist secularists. He constantly labels Bose as a Marxist secularist. This is a tall order, but let us take a look at the grounds he bases these accusations on. The broader point on how Tiwari's views are completely erroneous, Chandrachu Ghosh and Anurthar have already made. I will take it down on the finer points, how this fellow builds his fakery on a labyrinth of such lies, certain examples of which I just showed you. Now, his series on Subhash Bose begins with the title, The Seeds of Islam Islamophile Secularism. And he begins by selectively implicating personalities associated with Bose. First on target, Chitranjan Das, Bose's mentor for his uh, initial four years in Congress. And the charges? Charge number one, Khilafat. 
The very first point marks Tiwari's intention. Bose is not even present in India at the time these monumentally foolish blunders are being effected by the Congress, pushed by Gandhi, who had by this time started to act as a dictator, manipulating every Congress decision. The Congress Khilafat Alliance came about in June 1920 and Bose appears on the scene uh, one year later, a fresh 24-year-old in July 1921. And just a month after his arrival, the horrific fallout of Congress's Khilafat Talians has fallen on the hapless Hindus of Malabar. Tiwari seems very keen to show complicity of Chitranjan Das in Gandhi's Khilafat cause. Why? Transmitted guilt. Subhash Pose is held accountable not for what he has done, but since he would subsequently be put under Chitranjan Das's tutelage, Therefore, somehow Bose is guilty of the mindset behind Khilafat politics. But what exactly does he say Chitranjan Das is guilty of? He says Chitranjan Das exclusively carried out an over-enthusiastic campaign for the holy cause of Khilafat. Now, the fact of the matter is that after the very first Congress Khilafat meet in Amritsar, when the Congress decided to lend the full support of its power prestige and organization to the Khilafat uh, cause, a deputation was sent conveying the address of this conference to the Viceroy on January 19, 1920, which was represented by all these people who Sarvesh Tiwari has merrily exonerated to the exception of Chitranjan Das, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya, Bipin Chandrapal, Lala Lajpat Rai, Vallabhai Patel and more Swami Shraddhanand. Motilal Nehru and many other Congress leaders and it carried all their signatures. This was much before the terms of the Khilafat non-cooperation were decided in March 1921. Chitranjan Das is in no way involved until this time. From 1917 to 1921, he was dedicated entirely to the Bengal Provincial Congress and immediately after being elected president in 1920, he landed in jail. Tiwari says that these leaders who went along with Gandhi's Khilafat were actually against him. That's true enough. Quite a few leaders, including Jawaharlal Nehru, had uh, strong reservations about this whole deal. Tiwari gives a roundabout explanation of why Lala Lajpat Rai got talked into it. Lala Lajpat Rai finally acquiesced on the logic that if Britain came into possession or control of larger Muslim domains, it would only mean more Muslim influence on British policies, more Muslim recruitment in armed forces and undue pressure on India and Hindus. Now I don't know how that explains it, but he gives the impression that Chitranjan Das was all through gungo about it. Now here is a quote from Chitranjan Das in a letter to Lala Lajpat Rai. I am not afraid of 7 crores of Muslims here in Hindustan. But I think the 7 crores of Hindustan plus the armed hosts of Afghanistan, Central Asia, Arabia, Mesopotamia and Turkey will be irresistible. Here is a clear statement from Das expressing skepticism about uh, the Khilafat and its pan-Islamist dimension. He was in fact a forceful opponent of pan-Islamism. So what was happening is this, all these leaders were exchanging notes among themselves expressing their misgivings. But fact is, in the Khilafat non-cooperation, they all went along. They were all visionary men, but they had their blind moments and at that point, they all got bulldozed by Gandhi. Some of the quotes uh, Tiwari uses of Vipin Chandrapal, Sharat Chandra Chattopadhyay and Lala Lajpat Rai on the Hindu-Muslim issue, trying to offset Chitranjan Das's actions was said in different contexts, not on the Khilafat uh, question. R. C. Majumdar describes three types of persuasions of the congressmen at this time. Those blindly devoted to Gandhi, Patel types who thought Gandhi could do no wrong, others who passively gave in and yet others who voiced concerns but thought something good might actually come out of it. In the meeting in March 1920, 
finalizing the scheme and stages of the Khilafat non-cooperation movement were Gandhi, Ajmal Khan, Maulana Azad, Shaukat Ali and Lala Rajput Rai. Gandhi's ideas were adopted by the Khilafat conference which met at Madras on April 17, 1920. In June, another set of meetings was held with the Khilafat committee attended by Gandhi, Motilal Nehru, Lala Lajpat Rai, Tej Bahadur Sapru, Bipin Chandrapal, Madan Mohan Malviya, Satya Murti, Raja Gopal Achari, Jawaharla Nehru, Chintamani, No Chitranjan Das. All the same, many of these congressmen kept expressing uh, discomfort. But in the end, it was Tilak who gave his stamp of approval to the Congress resolution on the Khilafat program. Majumdar says the following about this whole case. The attitude of Tilak towards the non-cooperation movement initiated by Gandhi deserves more than a passing notice, as it is held by many that but for Tilak's death shortly before the Calcutta session of the Congress in 1920, Gandhi would not have been able to carry his resolution on non-cooperation. Tilak did not attend these uh, Hindu-Muslim joint meetings, but in the end seems to have assented to the resolutions. And Majumdar clarifies that Tilak's concurrence refers to the Khilafat program and not to the general Congress proposal of non-cooperation. It becomes clearer from the following quotes. To Shaukat Ali, Tilak says, about Hindus and Muslims, I will sign anything that Gandhi suggests because I have full faith on him in the question. He says to Mukhtar Ahmad Ansari, the Muslims could always count on his support in the course of the mild campaign which they were going to start under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. And Tilak's words conveyed by Dr. Choti Ram, he had no objection to his advising Hindus to join the movement, provided Mohammedans are sincerely bent upon non-cooperation with government. Anyone who reads these quotes would uh, think that Tilak was all for the Khilafat non-cooperation movement. But actually he wasn't. He somehow seems to have resigned to it. So here is the actual truth. Hindu leaders at this point did get carried away with Gandhi's lobbying and learnt a bitter lesson. Yet another one for Hindus. Only a few leaders volubly opposed Gandhi at this time. Sir Shankaran Nair, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Annie Besant and Bipin Chandrapal, who later refused to participate in the non-cooperation movement in general and on account of its hyphenation with the Khilafat issue in particular. But somehow, Sarvesh Tiwari stretches this to put the entire onus of collaboration with the Khilafat on Chitranjan Das. Also remember, Das has barely just joined the Congress at this time and Tiwari implies that his view has weighed in on all these Congress stalwarts of decades. And the best part, not only was Chitranjan Das not involved in any of this process, he actually opposed the Khilafat non-cooperation proposals of Gandhi in the Calcutta session uh, in September 1920. But yes, once it was approved by the Congress, Das appears to have thrown himself into it with sincerity, but his involvement was more on ground and limited to Bengal, mobilizing people locally, building up the tremendous strength of volunteers for the movement, organizing hartals, boycotts, etc. But this had nothing to do with an enthusiasm for Khilafat, that was entirely Gandhi's baby. Charge number two. Sarvesh Tiwari says that Teshpantu Das and Post Brothers practically elbowed out this visionary Hindu and hardliner. He means Bipin Chandrapal. This is an extremely funny claim, considering Das's total stint in the Congress was less than six years, from 1917 to 1922. And this was also the time that he spent in jail. Chitranjan Das had in fact a very close association with the Lal Bal Pal trio. His writings were published in Bande Mataram, that is Bipin Chandrapal's publication edited by Aurobindo Ghosh. They maintained contact all through uh, 
in his own journal, uh, Narayan Das used to publish writings of Sharat Chandra Chattopadhyay, Bipin Chandrapal and uh, Hari Prasad Shastri. Then Bipin Chandrapal left Congress in 1925-26 and Chitranjan Das has already departed from this world by then. Moreover, Das detached from the main Congress in December 1922 itself to form his uh, Swaraj party. Sharad Chandra Bose is also a member of the Swaraj party 1924 onwards and Subhash Bose was from the very beginning chanted to Bengal Congress. So how would they elbow out Bipin Chandrapal? Tiwari also says that Bipin Chandrapal seems to have been almost deleted from Bengali memory. This charges against the Bengali community. Don't know where he gets that idea from but uh, Bengalis would gawk at this statement. From Bipin Chandrapal Road, Bipin Chandrapal Sarani is at several places, Bipin Chandrapal Lodge, Hall, landmarks named after Pal are strewn all over Bengal. In Delhi's Chitranjan Park, half the landmarks are named after him, Bipin Chandrapal Mark, Bipin Chandrapal Clinic, Memorial Trust, Auditorium, Park, Library, several such named after Bipin Chandrapal. Every year they hold functions to uh, mark his birth anniversary as also Chitranjan Das and other freedom fighters. I think there would be hardly any youth in Bengal who hasn't read Pal's autobiography, Shottar Bachur. Then his Soul of India, another book which is widely read in Bengal. Incidentally, from classes 8 to 10th, Bipin Chandrapal's thoughts and philosophy are taught in detail and students are required to write essays on this. It is part of the state board syllabus. Central government had a portrait of Bipin Chandrapal in the central hall after almost 60 years of independence. So, aisa hai bhai sa, Bipin Chandrapal ko aap log bhool gaya hai, Bengali nahi bhool hai. But why is Tiwari shoving the guilt of Gandhi's Khilafat debacle on Chitran Jandas? Any guesses? It is mission get Bose. Since Bose would some one and a half years after this episode be put under Chitranjan Das's wing and as Chitranjan Das is supposedly a Muslim appeaser, therefore Subhash Bose is too. This is the premise he is trying to build. Fact is that Chitranjan Das actually belonged to this faction that stood in opposition to Gandhian politics and autocracy. He was more of a revolutionary makeup and used to fight cases for revolutionaries of the Anushilan party. This is the reason Gandhi put Subhash Bose under his wing. When Bose met Gandhi for the first time in July 1921, he openly talked about his fiery ideals and Gandhi thought, isse to udali dalo. The quote above from Chitran Jandas that I gave earlier shows that he was also a very pragmatic man. He was clearly talking in terms of dealing with Muslims rather than flighty Hindu-Muslim unity fantasies. Which brings us to the issue of the Bengal Pact of 1923. Now within the Congress there was opposition not only to uh, the Khilafat liaison but also the idea of non-cooperation itself. These two issues were working in the politics of the time parallelly. A whole lot of people who opposed non-cooperation perceived prominent leaders like Annie Besant, G.S. Kharpade, Bipin Chandrapal, Surendranath Banerjee, Tej Bahadur Sapru, Madan Mohan Malviya. They left the party subsequently. Telak had already passed away by this time in August 1920. He also believed in what was termed responsive cooperation and was not a buyer of Gandhi's non-cooperation. Chitranjan Das was firmly in this camp. He advocated a thing called internal obstruction, also known as council entry program, which proposed gaining entry into the legislatures with a view to offering uniform, continuous and consistent obstruction to the government on vital issues. Though strongly opposed to the British and an advocate of the ancient Indian way of life, he, as a matter of fact, rejected ideas of political and economic development of India along western lines. But Government of India Act was a great opportunity. It gave some important areas of 
governance to Indians like agriculture, local government, health and education, all of which were uh, critical subjects for Indians. Now the problem in Bengal, religious demography with Muslims 54% and Hindus 44% and as the posts were supposed to be elected councils. This was a peculiar problem in Bengal as well as Punjab. Punjab also had round about the same proportion of Muslims to Hindus, but there was also the factor of cultural bonds of Hindu Bengalis with Muslim Bengalis and Hindu Punjabis, naturally with Sikh Punjabis, but also with Muslim Punjabis. And I will come to this point a little later. Unless one takes a stand like Jinnah that there cannot be any middle ground and no solution possible except partitioning the country. The singular recourse available uh, to the leaders that time was figuring out ways for the two communities to work together to arrive at a functional arrangement. Sarvesh Tiwari types and Shankar Sharan, even Sita Ram Goel, keep going on and on about what Muslims are like. Look at their book, look at their ideology, look at the past. We know all that. Neither is the Islamic doctrine nor are Muslims going to go away. Muslims will continue to be a turbulent minority and a violent majority. And Muslim subnationalism will also always be there. The problem with these ideologues is that when they have ridden long enough on their ideology, they don't know what to do when they land on terra firma. You cannot wish away Muslims with Hindutva ideas. It is not that Sri Das thought, as Tiwari claims, that freedom cannot be won without Muslims. Das doesn't say this at any point. Reality is, however, that Muslims are there and you have to manage this demography. Hindus are very jarly. Now, go ahead and go to the mouth and go to the mouth. Don't talk They have no plan how to achieve this united greater India. They just dream about it. Now, in Bengal, though majority population was of Muslims, political power rested with the Hindus. All the educated, enlightened and empowered people were Bengali Hindus. The political and social life was dominated by them. This equation is what was threatened with the Government of India Act. The Hindus had to retain their position of dominance faced with this new prospect of electoral politics. The Bengal Muslim League was created at the behest of the British. Bose was not wrong about division created by British because he was not talking in some ideal terms, but what actually happened at the time of Bangavan. Viceroy Curzon partitioned Bengal on this pretext of providing rep greater representation to Muslims and it was favoured by them since it gave them a Muslim majority region in the eastern half and they would have catapulted to power due to sheer numbers. So, in December 1923, the Bengal Pact was drawn up which made significant concessions towards the Muslim community, some of which appeared disadvantageous to Hindus, but these were not extravagant considering that they were proportionate to their population. This is the basis of democracy. Even if Hindus kept power in their hands, it would have left discontent festering, which boiled over at times in the form of riots, and which gave the British the opportunity to create permanent fault lines. And don't please try to say that they did not do so, they definitely did. The idea was to give Muslims a fair representation to form a federation of Muslims and Hindus, to come together and cooperate, so that the question of partition did not arise. Das wanted to integrate them rather than having two hostile demographies perpetually at war. He therefore opposed the idea of separate electorates which eventually became the basis of partition. But this was outvoted by Hindus because they feared they would be outnumbered in most constituencies. But it is foolish to evaluate the provisions of the Bengal Pact against today's considerations based on what has already happened, that is the partition, rather than in the backdrop of those times when partition was merely a prospect that most people were not even ready to look at. Now, 
The Bengal Pack therefore addressed head on some of the flashpoints that had been the cause of violence and riots in the past, like playing of music, processions, slaughter by Muslims, language, etc. It was not a woolly headed dream of Bhaichara or appeasement, it was a straightforward deal. Point for point, addressing the issues between the two communities at the level of the leadership. Both had some and both had to concede some. A section of Hindus protested that time against the provisions. Like there was one provision uh, whereby Muslims were assured that their practice of cow slaughter on Eid will not be hindered and in return slaughter will not be practiced in any way offending to Hindu sensibilities. This allowance aroused the indignance of Hindus. Though again this was a bit of a futility since in British India cow slaughter was as it is legal. Large scale slaughter was carried out to cater to uh, Europeans and for supplying to the army. It made no sense imposing bans only on Muslims and for that one day. Besides, it was not an extraordinary concession since there were such compromises at other places too. For example, there is a precedent from Ayodhya in 1915, there a similar agreement was formalized between Hindus and Muslims and the latter agreed to carry out their butchery practice beyond a place called Jalpanala which marked the periphery of the city. And the proportion of Muslims in Ayodhya is far less than in Bengal. Moreover, the Bengal pact specified that except on the occasion of Eid al -Adha, no cow slaughter will take place out of respect for India's Hindu community and this was accepted by the Muslims. Yet uh, the Bengal pact did evoke outrage from some quarters and finally the National Congress did not pass it. But it brought tremendous support of the Muslims to the Swaraj party and made the Muslim League redundant in Bengal. In the bargain, the dominant position in the provincial council and in Bengal politics was retained by the Hindus in spite of absolute Muslim majority. Losing this would have been a far greater loss because until that time Muslim League had no representation among the population. They were insignificant. This is the reason Suravardi, whose father was one of the founding members of Muslim League, had joined the Cong uh, Swaraj party instead. Was the experiment successful? Like how? Unlike the Khilafat fiasco, Swaraj party's success at the provincial legislative council was remarkable, winning majority seats in the councils in 1924. The Swarajists also captured power in the Calcutta Municipal Corporation and thus became the first popularly elected mayor of Calcutta. This was when Subhash Pos was appointed CEO of Calcutta. Swaraj party inflicted repeated defeats on the government on vital issues and ensured the demise of British bureaucracy in its earlier form in Bengal. Not only did they win hands down, they managed to keep Bengal in remarkable peace and communal harmony for the next two to three years. In a time when scores of Hindu-Muslim riots would happen all over the country each year. And in spite of the Bengal pact being defeated by the Congress, Hindu-Muslim cooperation continued attested by many contemporary accounts. Even after Chitranjan Das's death, in the beginning of the 1926 riots, we find Muslim leaders like Suravardi participating in pacification campaigns. By the middle of the year, however, he had turned so virulently communal that the government was considering externing him. So look at Chitranjan Das's ingenuity and discernment that he managed to keep such extreme tendencies going together for almost three years without friction. Tiwari says that as the CEO of Calcutta Corporation, Subhash Pose outdid Chitranjan Das who had only proposed 55% communal reservation that too in Muslim majority districts which Calcutta was not. Subhash Pose appointed in Calcutta Corporation 25 Mohammedans out of 33 vacant posts not on the grounds of any merit but for their creed. First of all, Subhash Pose was CEO of Calcutta for barely two to three months. Moreover, this was not his doing. It was a clause in the Bengal pact itself 
that until the 55% strength in appointments was achieved, 80% would be earmarked for Muslims in Calcutta only to make up for the overall deficiency in Bengal because in the countryside there were hardly any educated Muslims. They constituted largely the poor peasantry. Bose was just explaining the official position since the Bengal Pact had been passed by the Bengal Provincial uh, Congress Committee. This is not the same as appeasement today which is disproportionate privileges as post-independence governments have been doing including your Hindutva heroes. In fact, the Bengal Pact laid down clearly that no religious community will be given undue preference, no government or public funds will be devoted to any religious institution or purpose. Now, you can keep imagining an ideal prospect according to Hindutva, but have we been able to take off even the loudspeakers of the mosques till date? You haven't been able to rectify the situation after most Muslims leaving India after 70 years of independence, of which around one and a half decades were of your beloved Hindutva governments. And you are singling out Chitranjandas, who was faced with a 55% Muslim majority population. He did not believe in the composite culture, Miraj. He just had a task at hand. He was a remarkably clear sighted, practical, yet a constructive uh, man. He is still widely regarded in Bangladesh. They mark his anniversary every year. In fact, uh, from the events, it becomes clear that in Bengal, the fragile communal situation was hinged on the personality of Chitranjan Das alone. The first major riots in Bengal happened after his death, the 1926 riots. Sarvesh Tiwari puts undue emphasis on these riots to prove God knows what point. Riots have been a regular feature of the Hindu-Muslim relationship since 18th century. To give an idea of the situation that time, since 1923 there were over 100 riots officially recorded, clustered mainly around Bombay, Punjab, Delhi, the United Provinces and Bihar, out of which 31 had been counted from the beginning of 1926 till 22nd August of that year when this particular series of riots began in Bengal. 91 riots were there between 1923 and 1927 in Uttar Pradesh alone. So what are you even talking about? In fact, a red sheet uh, that was uh, being circulated during the 1926 Bengal riots called to memory several previous recent riots in Kohat, Ludhiana, Meerut, Saharanpur, Ajmer, Kanpur, Lucknow, Allahabad and Calcutta. So, I don't know what really is the point proven here. Then he brings up the case of Tarakeshwar Satyagraha. Tarakeshwar is an ancient shrine and a medieval temple in Hooghly district of Bengal, which was in the hands of the Giri lineage of sannyasis. Tiwari uses very cunning rhetoric to appeal to the popular sentiment of Hindus against the government control of temples which is a sour point in today's politics. In order to portray the Tarakeshwar movement as Chitranjan Das along with his protege Bose hell bent on a secular takeover of Tarakeshwar temple which was foiled thank god by the Bengal Brahman Sabha. The poor Mahant was made to step down by the Congress. I cannot imagine how can one distort facts to this extent to defame a popular movement by devotees to regain their place of worship against a veritable villain of a Mahant in league with an oppressive and alien British government. Remember Congress is not government at this time. They had just marginal authority over some barely four to five administrative councils. An accurate comparison would be in fact the Sabarimala devotees movement against the communist government in Kerala. Sole exception being that the priests in Tarakeshwar were in cahoots with the uh, British government. And Sabrimala movement was to safeguard against secular liberalism, whilst in Tarakeshwar it was against libertinism. This movement started sometime in April, May 1924, when two saints, Swami Vishwananda and Swami Satchidananda, took the initiative on behalf of the devotees to 
remove the glaring aberrations that had crept into the management of this age-old religious institution, turning it into a den of corrupt and immoral activities and against the oppression suffered by pilgrims visiting the shrine. The Mahans at the helm of affairs, especially Madhav Chandragiri and uh, Satish Chandragiri, were said to have been the embodiments of irresponsible power and sensuality. So, resentment had been building up as a genuine reaction against the abuses of the later Mahans. And Swami Vishwananda had been on one previous occasion mercilessly beaten up by the Tarakeshwar Mahan's goons for standing up to him. They formed an organization of sannyasis called Mahavirtal, which then formally approached the Bengal Provincial Congress with a signed appeal to start a non-violent satyagraha. They specifically alluded to the Akali movement and SGPC's correspondence with Gandhi seeking permission to begin Satyagraha in order to wrest control of their sites from the Udasi Mahans. And the details of immorality and misappropriations by the last Mahant of Tarakeshwar, Dandi Swami Satish Chandragiri, behind this unrest are no less shocking, including appropriating the estates of the trust as a private property and lording over it like a zamidar. He lived a luxurious life moving around on elephants and horses, a total debauch who was said to have given up his commitment to the injunctions of Brahmacharya. He was a giri only in name. He had lakhs worth of jewellery stashed away in banks and he had received the title of Raja from the British government. He had a private army of Gurkhas known as Birbhadradal and hired goons to terrorize the tenants of his estate, students and shopkeepers. His hirelings used to block the pilgrims access to the temple to extort money from them and he was notorious for violating the modesty of women pilgrims. Sorry if this sounds like a Bollywoodish villain but unfortunately this is what it was. These later Tarakeshwar Mahans were infamously corrupt and this was not the first time that they had been involved in such shameful scandals. There was a previous case a couple of decades before this, very famous by the name Tarakeshwar affair, also known as the Elokeshi affair, wherein a respectable wife who had gone there seeking treatment for infertility had been raped by the chief man. It culminated in a horrific case of honor killing. And Tiwari is making a case for these profligates. Ye to in Mahashaya sense of dharma hai. Das and Subhash Pos, when the present case was brought to their notice, went to the place on a fact-finding mission in April 1924. And thereafter, a formal report was made. The Mahavir Tal had also written separately to Hindu Mahasabha on April 3rd, 1924. And independent inquiries made by a committee instituted by the Hindu Sabha of uh, Bada Bazaar also referred to the illegal exactions by the agents of the Mahant for, from the pilgrims, uh, vendors and residents of the pilgrim town as well as two cases of violation of women visiting the place of pilgrimage. So all these charges were confirmed by the Hindu Mahasabha. Subhash Pos then wrote to the provincial Hindu Sabha based on the findings to take up the issue failing which the Bengal Congress Committee would have to bring itself in. And hereafter, there is no involvement of Subhash Pos in this affair. He is not there in any capacity in any of the committees or reports. So, offices of Mahavir Dal were established at Tarakeshwar and Calcutta and a committee was made of members of the Bengal Hindu Sabha, Brahman Sabha and Mahavir Dal. They also had the support of the community of saints, among them Pandit Dharanath Bhattacharya and the Samkhya master Vedanta Tirtha Sri Sharachandra. Other temples also gave support, notably Balaji Dev temple. And the Akali set up a langar khana for the protesters. The Congress provided logistical support, but they were not directly involved at this stage. Basically, it was a religious reform movement and not a political movement. Satyagraha started in earnest for free access of devotees 
to the temple for restoring worship according to shastras and to ensure the dignity of female pilgrims. A massive democratic movement to reclaim the temple which had been turned into a huge private fief by the Mahant. The Mahant responded by setting his army upon the people. He summoned the British government to his aid, which was followed by brutally repressive measures, shooting, jailing of a number of devotees, mercilessly beaten up in custody, including 14 minors in Bankura jail. Several lives were lost. This was when, at the request of Mahavir Dal, the Bengal Provincial Congress Committee actively got involved because they couldn't handle it any longer. But Sarvesh Tiwari, of course, finds the remark of Lord Lytton more trustworthy, who dismissed it as a colossal hoax. The same Lytton who made the smirking remark that Indian village women complaining of rape by British police were lying to smear the police. He was, of course, made to withdraw his remark, but these are the kind of sources used by Tiwari. Far from taking over the temple, Das clearly stated that he would be no party to any settlement which will not protect the people of Tarakeshwar or those who st stood by a true religious spirit against the Mahant. The temple and the debtor property, property devoted to the deity, must also be protected. Tiwari says that Gandhi had to intervene to stop Chitranjan Das from taking over the temple. Again, plain lie. One Subodh Krishna Basu, identifying himself as the secretary of the Hindu Temple Reform League, had sent a telegram to the governor, the viceroy and to Gandhi, praying their intervention since after the publication of Deshbandhu Das's message to adopt Satyagraha, riot and violence started this morning in Tarakeshwar Temple. Public apprehends repetition of Chauri Chora. This was found to be spurious and the man turned out to be a lucky of the Mahant. So there was a verification campaign against Das, of course, planted by the Mahant's agents, accusing him of all and sundry, creating friction between landlords and tenants, portraying him as a proponent of the permanent settlement, calling him a Brahmo who wanted to do away with Hindu shrines, of taking political advantage of the struggle and using temple funds for his party. Canards along usual lines which Sriman Tripathi also eagerly circulates. But to wind up, quoting Das's own words on this, I do not desire any friction between landlords and tenants. I have opposed the idea of such class war from public platforms. The question of the repeal of permanent settlement is an undesirable question to raise and in my opinion, whatever steps are taken must be taken after the attainment of self-government and even then only as a matter of agreement between landlords and tenants. I am not a Brahmo, I am a Hindu and I claim to be sincere. It is absolutely untrue that I want to take up Hindu shrines to finance my party. My point of view is the Hindu point of view. I want the shrines to be purified and reformed. I do not want to remove Mahanship but to have a devout Mohant appointed so that the service in the temple may be properly supervised and income applied to the good of the pilgrims and the locality by establishing such educational and charitable institutions as may be required for the good of the people. In my opinion, this is not politics, but if it is so regarded, I am not ashamed of it. Nor is it true that I want the Mohanship to go to some Bengali instead of a Hindi speaking gentleman. I do not wish to interfere in the slightest degree with the traditions of the particular sect to which the Mohant belongs. In the end, Chitranjan Das wanted an independent trust of stakeholders, created from among the community of devotees and worshippers to look after the affairs of the temple. The temple as well as the estate along with other properties and effects would be considered as public properties managed by the committee alone. And the word public here doesn't mean the government, it means the people in general. He had proposed a settlement whereby the incumbent Mahant, Satish Chandra Giri, would abdicate in favour of his chela, Prabhat Chandra Giri, who would be under the control of the committee. The settlement made provisions for the maintenance of the temple, 
worship of the deity, development of facilities at the pilgrimage, charities undertaken by the committee, and allowances for the outgoing, incumbent, as well as the future months. Everything except secular causes or nation building activities as Tiwari claims. These are outright malicious lies. But the settlement was in the end opposed by the Brahman Sabha because they wanted a committee of Brahmins to be interested with the running of the temple. So Brahman Sabha and Mahavir Dal separately approached the government to appoint a receiver. And this is when government intervention happened, not by Chitranjan Das. Tiwari's entire refrain is built on layers and layers of such misrepresentations, convoluted logic and plain fibs. It would take all day if I undertake to deconstruct the elaborate slander. So let me take up some basic concepts uh, which give us an idea of the times and help fit facts correctly in the picture because one can endlessly keep perpetuating misconceptions and uh, prejudice. The alternative is to gain a perspective with which to understand and learn from past events. The first one is the term leftist, which Tiwari uses abundantly to show Bose as a communist. You will find Subhash Bose also emphatically identified himself as a leftist. But the left, center and right political positions in those days uh, were different from today, as in uh, right representing the Hindu nationalists, uh, the center the secularists and the left the communists. Left in those days denoted the faction, especially those within the Congress that stood for aggressive uh, means of winning the rights of Indians and ultimately freedom, colloquially known as Karamdal. So all of these, Lal, Bal, Pal, Chitranjan Das, Vithal Bhai Patel, Motilal Nehru, Narsimha, Chintaman Kelkar, etc. were known as leftists or even extremists. It was these people who were known as the Swarajists and who eventually formed the separate Swaraj party. In Subhash Bose's own words, in the present political phase of Indian life, leftism means anti-imperialism. A genuine anti-imperialist is one who believes in undiluted independence, not Mahatma Gandhi's substance of independence as the political objective and in uncompromising national struggle as the means for attaining it. He described those with a softer approach, the Naramdal, as those prepared for a deal with imperialism. About the difference in their aims, he writes, the goal of the Congress as defined in the Constitution had been self-government within the British Empire. This had antagonized all those congressmen who believed in the severance of the British connection or who refused to be tied down to the empire. To enable the left fingers to return to the Congress poll, the goal of the Congress was declared to be Swaraj, which means literally self-rule and it was left to individual congressmen to define Swaraj in their own way. Mr. Gandhi, however, defined Swaraj to mean self-government within the empire if possible and outside if necessary. So Gandhi and his followers had no mission of independence at all. That's why the parties Swaraj and Forward Bloc were formed. Communists were a different class of politicians altogether. CPI was established in 1920s. Its leaders were Satyadanand Vishnu Ghate, Manavendra Nath Roy, etc. And true to the Marxist doctrine, they tried their violent revolutionary means to upstage the British, but not out of nationalist sentiment. They all had these extraterritorial loyalties towards Russia, various communist leaders abroad, and their ideology above the nation. Bose repudiated communism in the clearest terms in his elaborately laid out criticisms of uh, communism. He wrote to introduce fresh cleavage within our ranks by talking openly of class war and working for it appears to me at the present moment to be a crime against nationalism. To what straits we may be reduced 
by a malassimilation of Karl Marx and Bakunin becomes manifest when we come across a certain class of Indian laborites or communists if you call them so who openly advocate the use of British or foreign cloth on the plea of internationalism. If I had the remotest intention of becoming a Bolshevik agent, I would have jumped at the offer made and taken the first available boat to Europe. If I succeeded in recouping my health, I could then have joined the gay band who trot about from Paris to Leningrad, talking of world revolution and emitting blood and thunder in their utterances. But I have no such intention or desire. So Bose was well aware of the folly of socialist casteist ideas which other Indian leaders and writers were, are till now easily deceived by and have been inserting permanent fissures within Indian society. Subhash Chandra Bose was very clear in stating that the communist model of internationalism was incompatible with, the, in, with India because it is removed from her spiritual ethos and that India, in India, a national awakening is in most cases heralded by a religious reformation and a cultural renaissance. There was an incident during Bose's arrest in October 1924. The British wanted to keep him in longer and remove him uh, to a far off place since they saw him as dangerous. They therefore tried to devise stronger charges against him to defame him and among these uh, was the charge of corresponding with communist leaders abroad. Bose was forced to file a defamation petition through his brother, vehemently denying the charges. So, association with communists was actually seen as an ignominious circumstance. Subsequently, the communists have consistently tried to appropriate the revolutionary nationalist legacy. Characters of the Indian revolutionary movement are portrayed in their writings as communists. For example, Surya Sen. There is a movie on Master Da Surya Sen in which Indian revolutionaries are shown giving the slogan Kranti Ki Jai Ho, whereas this was never the revolutionaries call. They were entirely motivated by devotion for the motherland and their cry was Vande Mataram. Then Bhagat Singh, Jugantar, the 1857 mutiny, they portray them all as communist movements and personalities and Subhash Chandra Bose, which is funny considering that uh, these communists used to abuse Subhash Bose in the profanest terms in their publications, which I am not reproducing here for the sake of brevity, but they hated the Indian National Army, they were West loyalists. They snooped on INA operatives and acted as British informants in the war period and uh, the right wing dopes. They actually advance uh, the leftist narrative and deprecate their own icons. They are a brainless and petty lot, completely lacking perspective and only intent on one upmanship against one another and self-promotion. There is a concept in Silicon Valley. When startups want to raise funds, they project their technology as disruptive technology to get the attention of venture capitalists and the HNIs. This is what these so-called uh, scholars do, come up with sensational theories to grab the attention of people and unfortunately these are readily lapped up by a section that subscribes to these prejudicial ideas. Tiwari refers to Bose all through in his litany as a Marxist secularist, the reason Subhash Bose founded the forward block. This is again a case of uh, anachronist distortion. Truth is, Forward Bloc was formed around four years after the Swaraj Party had disintegrated in the time when Bose was in Mandalay prison and soon after Chitranjan Das died. Bose subsequently found it impossible to come to terms with Gandhian tyranny and had to leave uh, the Congress. But like the Swaraj Party, Forward Bloc was a part of the Congress and represented the more fiery and forceful elements among them. It was known as forward block of the Indian National Congress. So when did this change? In February 1946, when a forward block workers assembly was held in Jabalpur 
and at this point Indian communists uh, started infiltrating the party. The session resulted in a declaration. Forward Bloc is a socialist party accepting the theory of class struggle in its fullest implications and a program of revolutionary mass action for the attainment of socialism leading to a classless society. This was a market departure from Subhash Bose's policy and vision. No wonder this did not go down well with the Swarajis nationalists and the party split forming into two factions. Uh, forward bloc Subhashist, the uh, nationalist faction led by Ramchandra Sakharam Ruikar and Sardul Singh Kavishar and forward bloc Marxist, the communist faction led by Shil Bhadrayagi and Kishore Narsingh Joglikar. Thereafter, in February 1948, a party national council meet was held in Varanasi in which it was decided to sever all ties with Indian National Congress. This was actually a reaction to a Congress uh, decision earlier that year to expel all dissenting tendencies within the Congress. Thereafter, a lot of splits happened, uh, especially after uh, Sharad Bose died. But uh, basically the leftist Marxist character of our bloc in its various permutations and combinations and avatars was acquired over a couple of decades after Subhash and Sharad Bose's deaths. Now the concept of secularism, communalism and nationalism in those days. Tiwari is outraged that Subhash Bose describes the Hindu Mahasabha as a communal party, speaking of them in the same terms as the Muslim League and he refers to the Indian National Congress as nationalist just as the politics of today. But the term communal also did not have the same connotations that time as today. Firstly, the term secularism as counterposed with communalism was not much in circulation at that time. It was hardly used. The opposite of the term communalism was nationalism. And this simply meant that some parties uh, catered to limited community interests while others were nationalist in orientation. It is in this sense that the words of Subhash Chandra Bose after a meeting with Savarkar on June 21st or 22nd 1940 have to be regarded. Bose had said Mr. Jinnah was then thinking only of how to realize his plan of Pakistan with the help of the British. Mr. Savarkar seemed to be oblivious of the international situation and was only thinking how Hindus could secure military training by entering Britain's army in India. From these interviews, the writer himself uh, was forced to the conclusion that nothing could be expected from either the Muslim League or the Hindu Mahasabha. Alighting out of this meeting, Bose appeared somewhat disappointed in terms of the outcome. And his words that time have been used by leftist secularist writers to claim Bose as their own, as these have been used by our friend Tiwari to implicate him as anti-Hindu. Bose's outlook was principally nationalistic, who did not want the intrinsic weaknesses of Indians to come in the way of their greatness as a nation in the world stage as he envisioned India. He appears frustrated in his attempt to build a broad coalition for a nationwide movement against the British government and was clearly disappointed with both. To understand this better, let us take a look at how Aurobindo thought about these two characters at the opposite ends of the spectrum. He says, strange as it may appear, Mr. Savarkar and Mr. Jinnah, instead of being opposed to each other on the one nation versus two nations issue are in complete agreement about it. Both agree, not only agree, but insist that there are two nations in India, one the Muslim nation and the other the Hindu nation. This was the cause for Bose's frustration. He was aware that if India failed to bridge this gap, she will be fractured and weakened, which would suit the imperialists' designs just as they had been successful in doing in other parts of the world. This was the feeling of all leaders with a nationalist orientation and this is what uh, even Aurobindo said. India is free 
But she has not achieved unity, only a fissured and broken freedom. The old communal division into Hindu and Muslim seems to have hardened into the figure of a permanent political division of the country. It is to be hoped that the Congress and the nation will not accept the settled fact as forever settled or as anything more than a temporary expedient. For if it lasts, India may be seriously weakened, even crippled. Civil strife may remain always possible, possible even a new invasion and foreign conquest. The partition of the country must go. It is to be hoped by a slackening of tension, by a progressive understanding of the need of peace and concord, by the constant necessity of common and concerted action, even of an instrument of union for that purpose. In this way, unity may come about under whatever form. The exact form may have a pragmatic but not a fundamental importance. But by whatever means, the division must and will go. For without it, the destiny of India might be seriously impaired and even frustrated, but that must not be. These words echo the thought and motivation of Subhash Bose. Now, Savarkar was also in this group that did not want partition. As Aurobindo says further, they, Savarkar and Jinnah, differ only as regards the terms and conditions on which the two nations should live. Mr. Jinnah says India should be cut up into two, Pakistan and Hindustan, the Muslim nation to occupy Pakistan and the Hindu nation to occupy Hindustan. Mr. Savarkar, on the other hand, insists that although there are two nations in India, India shall not be divided into two parts, one for Muslims and the other for the Hindus, that the two nations shall dwell in one country and shall live under the mantle of one single constitution that the constitution shall be such that the Hindu nation will be enabled to occupy a predominant position that is due to it and the Muslim nation made to live in the position of subordinate cooperation with the Hindu nation. Now, this is faithful to the ideology that Savarka represents, but it does not address how this ideal situation is going to be achieved. Would Muslims accept the proposition of a predominant position of Hindus? If indeed partition was not acceptable as an option, the only other option was accepting a workable compromise that ensured mutual coexistence and peace. This entailed a hard-headed, honest look at the differences, sensitivities, triggers and to develop a scope of cooperation. This is what the Bengal Pact did and the Lucknow Pact of 1916 proposed to do. This cannot happen from a rigid ideological position. Fact is, even until this time, most people did not, could not conceive of a partition of India. This is the reason for limited appeal of both these parties, uh, which we will look at presently. S. Krishna here in a forward block issue of December 30th, 1939, writes of Savarkar as follows and it can be assumed it reflects uh, Bose's view as well since he used to edit uh, this maxim. Mr. Savarkar has evidently been, been embittered by the sinister growth of Muslim communalism in the country. It is undoubtedly a most sickening and dangerous phenomenon in Indian politics today. But his panache for the grave evil is undoubtedly of a desperate nature. It is neither practicable nor prudent to divide the country into warring camps and thus prepare it for a future bloodbath. These lines clearly reveal Bose's acknowledgement of the Muslim menace and an understanding of Savarkar's reasons. Yet he stressed on a practical solution for bridging the widening chasm, failing which the only casualty would be Indian nation owned. Now, were there any Muslim nationalists to work with? Sarvesh Tiwari has a problem that Fazlul Haq is uh, referred to as a nationalist Muslim by Bose. But he neglects to tell you that during the Khilafat movement, Haq led the anti-Khilafat non-cooperation faction within the Bengal Provincial Muslim League against the pro-Ottoman faction. He was like the Swarajists. He favoured working uh, within the constitutional framework uh, rather than boycotting legislatures and colleges. 
he was instrumental in the Lucknow Pact between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, which was a hope of bringing a resolution to the differences between the two communities, the communities to avert partition. He concurrently held the presidentship of Muslim League and the general secretaryship of Congress. He resigned uh, from Congress later. Now, diarchy gave way to an autonomous provincial system with the Government of India Act of 1935, which replaced provincial ministries responsible to legislatures for some of the functions of government with ministries responsible for all. And even though Fazlul Haq won the elections of Bengal Provincial Council with heavy majority, he gave half the positions in his cabinet to Hindus. His second government, formed in December 1941, was a coalition and supported by whom? Not the Muslim League. Haq had been ousted from the League after a conflict with uh, Jinnah. Supporters included the Trishak Praja Party, led by Shamsuddin Ahmad, the forward bloc, Swarajist members of the Bengal Congress and the Hindu Mahasabha, led by Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Even in this cabinet, Hindus and Muslims were evenly represented. In fact, Savarkar expressed appreciation for the successful functioning of the government under Fazlul Haq, the same who Tiwari calls a jihadi. It was after Haq's resignation, forced by the British governor, that Muslim League separatist politics came to the fore in Bengal. Haq later joined the Bengal Krishak uh, Praja Party, which staunchly opposed the idea of Pakistan. It should be understood that uh, the Government of India Act of 1935 was not really well-meaning. It was actually meant to break India to several pieces by increasing the power of the provinces, uh, princely states and minority communities who refused to let the Congress, which pitched itself and was perceived as a nationalist, uh, uh, as a national party, to speak for them. The communal award of 1932 was a prelude to it, creating separate electorates for minority religions and the so-called depressed classes and reserved seats. And this is what uh, fierce nationalists like Bose were against, creating factions instead of reinforcing the national identity. They saw merit in measures that mainstreamed all uh, identities into a national one. And Bose's statement, which Tiwari is portraying negatively, affirmed this view. The introduction of, Khilafat, uh, of the Khilafat question into Indian politics was unfortunate, as has already been pointed out. If the Khilafatist Muslims had not started a separate organization, but had joined the Indian National Congress, the consequences would not have been so undesirable. This is not appeasement. It was not said to justify the violence uh, that resulted from the Khilafat affair. He was against ghettoization of identities, which can turn any community against the uh, national identity. This is what Muslim League politics began with, first demanding se reservations, then separate electorates and finally separate nations. Didn't we see it happening with the Sikhs, Dalit minoritism, Buddhist separatism? Even some Jains have started this Hindu hostile discourse. The story of uh, Shaivites persecuting the Jains in Madurai, etc. The problem, therefore, is more with minority identity politics rather than minority itself. Creating factions based on minority identities is anti national. It is equal to conceding that minority aspirations will not be fulfilled within the national identity. Ironically, we continue the uh, same politics today. This is what Subhash Post meant by communalism. Stating that Muslims and Hindus are separate nations is communalism, irrespective of whether it is said aggressively uh, like Muslim League or defensively like Mahasabha, and even if the latter did not actually want partition. One has to acknowledge that Muslim communal aspirations are going to remain no matter how many parts you cut out of your country. It has to be minimized and managed by mainstreaming 
making them believe that their aspirations will be fulfilled by a united nation only. Clearly, a whole lot of Muslims pre-partition also thought so. This will not work by making differences with their worldview the ground for permanent antagonism. It is quite clear from Bose's calculated and clear-cut uh, moves in Germany that he knew well enough how the Muslim mind worked. But he realized that it had to be negotiated, not negated and neutralized from interfering with the national process. This Akhand Bharat picture which the Virat Hindus based on their profiles but are clueless in reality how this is going to be achieved. Bose was actually working towards it. He had a much greater vision of India. This cannot be achieved in an ideologues, ideologues purist dream. It needs a very clear mind in touch with real politics. So, what were the realistic prospects? One has to remember that until 1937, Muslim League politics continued to be focused on India rather than separatism. Even in the 1930 declaration of Muhammad Iqbal, the idea was of a federal structure within an Indian confederacy. Muslim League politics weared off towards separatism in 1940 with the Lahore Resolution. In this, Haq had actually proposed several autonomous Muslim majority states rather than a unified Pakistan. It is notable that delegates of Punjab and Bengal were firmly opposed to the idea of Pakistan. They were for autonomous states based on ethnicity and uh, religious demography. Muslim League started their mobilization for Pakistan 1937 onwards under Jinnah with processions and strikes etc. But they did not have significant success. Even the students and faculty of Aligarh Muslim University supported the All India Nationalist Movement until 1939. Muslim League for the first time started attracting masses after the Lahore Resolution and even then they did not by any means represent the majority of Muslims. In opposition to the Lahore Resolution, a gathering of the All India Azad Muslim Conference a huge coalition of nationalist Muslims representing multiple organizations came together in Delhi in April 1940, giving a call for a united India. The attendance at this rally was reported to be about five times than the attendance at the League meeting. They fiercely opposed separatist Muslims. Their leaders were the Deobandi scholar Maulana Saeed Hussain Ahmed Madani. He travelled across British India spreading the idea that he wrote about in his book, Composite Nationalism and Islam, <clears throat> which uh, stood for Hindu-Muslim unity and opposed the concept of partition of India. One of the very popular uh, leaders was Allah Baksh Sumro. He was murdered in uh, 1943, most likely by Muslim League goons. And after his uh, demise, it is said, it became easier for the All India Muslim League to push the demand for creation of Pakistan. Then there was the Unionist Party of Punjab with leaders like Sikandar Hayat Khan, Fazli Hassan and Chotu Ram, which stood for United Punjabi Identity, including Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus. Like the Swarajists, uh, they had prevailed in Punjab politics until 1923 and dominated right up till the 1937 provincial elections in which Muslim League uh, lost dismally. Muslim League was a very elitist outfit and not until the 1946 provincial elections did they have any significant electoral wins. There was another movement in Punjab, the Khaksas of Allama Mashriki. I am surprised that Sarvesh Tiwari labels Mashriki as a jihadi. The Khaksars were kind of Islamic Unitarians, if you will. They believed in unity of the divine and of mankind and rejected Islamic exclusivity and the idea of jihad. They were fiercely opposed to the partition agenda of Muslim League. They were known to have saved many Hindu and Sikh lives in the partition violence. Some Khaksar volunteers gave up their own lives trying to save them. 
the organization also fought many INA cases. They did want a dispensation by majority Muslims, but they cannot be called jihadis. This is a case of tilting at the windmills, which Virat Hindus do all the time. Then they were the Khudai Khidmatgar, led by Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, and scores of others Anjumani Watan, Baluchistan, All India Jamur Muslim League, All India Momin Conference, Jamayat Ulema e Hind, Majlis e Harar Ul Islam. All, All India Momin Conference, All India Shia Political Conference, uh, Krishak Praja Party, All India Muslim Majlis, Jamayat Ahli Hadis, and many Christian and uh, Sikh groups as well. So, was Bose uh, ignorant about Muslim separatism and pan Islamism? In one of his Radio Azad Hind broadcasts, he says, I appeal to the brave Majlis e Aharar, the nationalist Muslim party of India that started the civil disobedience campaign in 1939 against Britain's war effort before any other party did so. I appeal to the Jamaatul Ulema, the old representative organization of the Ulemas or the Muslim Divines of India, led by that distinguished patriot and leader Mufti Kefatullah. I appeal to the Azad Independent Muslim League another important organization of the nationalist Muslims of India. I appeal to the Akali Dal, the leading nationalist Sikh party of India. And last but not the least, I appeal to the Praja party of Bengal, which commands the confidence of that province and is led by well-known patriots. I have no doubt that if all these organizations join in this struggle, the day of India's liberation will be drawn nearer. As can be seen, the appeal is addressed selectively to those Muslim organizations that stood for a unified India, something that he desperately strove for. Bose's idea was to harness these sentiments of unity rather than alienating them with uh, hardline postures. We have today in India created one block of all these divergent streams of Muslims because of minoritism and then we complain Muslims act as a block. This is exactly what Bose was against. He was rallying Muslims who identified with the Indian nation rather than pan-Islamism. And if there weren't any nationalist Muslims, why do Hindu nationalists today talk uh, to people like Tarek Patel, Taslim Anasrin, Tahir Gora, Khalid Umar? Virat Hindus rally behind uh, these people. Tiwari has also claimed that Bose was ambivalent on the question of partition. Basing this on a singular sentence that he picks out from one of the Azad Hind broadcasts, where Bose actually throws a calculated bait at Jinnah that Pakistan could be created only, only under a national government. Tiwari ignores the literally hundreds of emphatic statements before and after this from Bose vehemently opposing partition and playing Jinnah and the Muslim League. The particular broadcast where he is quoting from has long passages before this sentence addressing all nationalist sentiments to come together for independence. He mentions the nationalist Muslim organizations to keep up their struggle for a united India. He elaborately explains how Anglo-American internationalism exploits uh, divisions to break up nations, weaken them and dominate them. He says uh, that the British you support will break you up and keep exploiting you. A quote uh, from this address, the Union Jack would then fly not only over the capital of India as at present, but over the capitals of Hindustan, Pakistan, Rajasthan, Khalistan and Pathanistan and the Indian people would be given a British guarantee of permanent enslavement. Let Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah and his Muslim League ponder over this. And then he says uh, that line for Jinnah, ke bhai, bina independence ke to aapko Pakistan bhi nahi milega. Meaning, why not come together uh, for the sake of independence? Because Muslim League was supporting the British war, in return extracting the promise of Pakistan. This entire speech Tiwari has not mentioned. He only picks out that single line to portray Bose as equivocating on Pakistan. Is this not dishonesty? Without the slightest chance of a doubt, Bose was a fierce nationalist who could never be persuaded to accept partition. 
at no cost, unlike politicians and ideologues of that time who did. Had he been there, he would have done all his all to prevent it and very likely succeeded. Tiwari denies uh, that Mujibur Rahman's words conveyed an element of Bose's appeal among Muslims, but reproducing that quote from Mujib's biography. When we listened to Subhash Bose addressing us on the radio from Singapore, we used to get excited. It seemed to us that if he managed to land his troops in Bengal, it would be easy for us to oust the English. But then again, it occurred to us that having him in Bengal would not bring us any nearer to Pakistan. And what would happen to the millions of Muslims of the country then? But then again, I thought that someone who could leave everything in his country to spearhead a movement for its independence could never be parochial in his outlook. In my mind, my respect for Subhash Bose continued to grow. Clearly, he saw Bose's appeal among Indians beyond parochial boundaries. Tiwari's disconnect lies in viewing the Hindu Mahasava as the pivot of Hindus. But was it really so? Fact of the matter is, they had absolutely no representation among Hindus. His view of Indian National Congress as anti-national is based on the present day perceptions, not how the party was regarded at that time. It was very much a nationalist party and also a Hindu representation primarily. And this is clear from Bose's statement, which Tiwari is misrepresenting as anti-Hindu. Hindu Mahasabha has come forward to play a political role and to make a bid for the political leadership of Bengal, or at least of the Hindus of Bengal, who have been the backbone of nationalism in this country. With a real Hindu Mahasabha, we have no quarrel and no conflict. But with a political uh, Hindu Mahasabha, that seeks to replace the Congress in the political life of Bengal and for that purpose has already taken the offensive against us, a fight is inevitable. This fight has just begun. He is clear that Hindu Mahasabha as representatives of Hindu communal interests are acceptable. This was Savarkar's reasoning too, that as long as Muslim League existed, there should be an organization that represented Hindu rights as well. But Bose was clear that this subjective limited viewpoint could not replace or derail the nationalist vision. One quote where he articulates the problem and uh, the task of genuine nation builders. I believe that what is wanted most of all is the will to be one nation and to hold together as one nation when foreign domination ceases. Thus, to my mind, the problem of unity is largely a psychological problem. The people must be educated and drilled to feel that they are one nation. Other factors like uh, language, dress, food, etc. may help unity but cannot create it. How much was Hindu Mahasabha true to their purest ideology, really? The Government of India Act of 1935 ended up having the opposite effect of what it was intended to undermine the Congress's appeal as a national party because Congress ended up winning most provincial councils in the 1937 provincial assembly elections. In 1939, in protest against Viceroy Lord Linlithgow's action of declaring India as a belligerent in the Second World War without consulting the Indian representatives, Congress ministers resigned or were made to resign by the high command. As a result, the provincial governments ceased to exist, much to the joy of the British and the Muslim League. Jinnah exulted, I wish the Muslims all over India to observe Friday 22nd December as the day of deliverance and thanksgiving as a mark of relief that the Congress regime has at last ceased to function. I hope that the provincial, district and primary Muslim leagues all over India will hold public meetings and pass the resolution with such modification as they may be advised and after Jumma prayers offer prayers by way of thanksgiving for being delivered from the unjust Congress regime. And who supported them at this time? The Hindu Mahasabha. They got together with Muslim League to form governments 
in Sindh, northwest frontier province and Bengal. They tried to form a government with them in Punjab as well. Then in 1943, the Hindu Mahasabha members joined hands with Sardar Aurangzeb Khan of the Muslim League to form a government in Northwest Frontier Province. And in March 1943, when Sindh government became the first provincial assembly of the subcontinent to pass an official resolution in favor of the creation of Pakistan, Hindu Mahasabha was part of that government and did not think of resigning on matter of principle. So, where was their Hindutva that time? Subhash Bose's above comment that Tiwari selectively quotes to Bose's disadvantage came in the context of similar double dealing by many Bengal Hindu Mahasabha members in the municipal elections. In the same passage, Bose has also referred to nationalist members in Hindu Mahasabha. But did Savarkar and Bose differ significantly in their views? Tiwari brushes away Bose's deep spiritual inclinations and his uh, love for the motherland rooted in his beliefs, saying that they were just personal beliefs. But can you name any other leader who professed such deep faith in the divine? Nehru, Patel, Savarkar, Shama Prasad? I quote Bose's words in a letter written to his mother in 1912-1913 as a tender 15 year old. How much longer shall we sleep? How much longer shall we go on playing with non-essentials? Shall we continue to turn a deaf ear to the wailings of our nation? Our ancient religion is suffering the pangs of near death. Does that not stir our hearts? How long can one sit with folded arms and watch the state of our country and religion? In the summer of 1914, he made of from his home accompanied by a friend for a pilgrimage and to look for a guru that he had been seeking for a long time. He talks of the sacred rivers and the chardhams and the ideals held forth by Shankaracharya, Swami Vivekananda and Aurobindo on Hinduism as the fundamental identity and essence of Indians, uh, he writes. Though geographically, ethnologically and historically India represents an endless diversity to any observer, there is nonetheless a fundamental unity underlying this diversity. The most important cementing factor has been the Hindu religion. North or south, east or west, wherever you may travel, you will find the same religious ideas, the same culture and the same tradition. All Hindus look upon India as the holy land. Everywhere the same scriptures are read and followed and the epics, the Mahabharat and the Ramayana are equally popular wherever you travel. In Mandalay Jail, he wrote an article on muscular Hinduism in which he noted how Christianity and Islam had created empires by converting millions and chalked out plans to separate Hinduism as far as Africa as a crusading, proselytizing religion with a zest and influence to match that of Islam and Christianity. He talked about the need to regenerate the Aryan blood. As I wander about the hills, I think about this very often. The sense of power must permeate our entire being, meaning the Hindus. We again have to leap across mountains. It was only when Aryans did such things that they were able to produce the Vedas. How is this different from the view of Navagopal Mitra, who Sarvesh Tiwari holds out as a Hindutva icon? So, concentrating on Hindu communal interests and chalking out the destiny of India as a powerful Hindu nation are two separate aspects. On the former, they had separate perspectives. Bose did not see Savarkar's narrow focus as expedient to his grand design for India. On the latter, his and Savarkar's views were perfectly identical. If it was said that Bose was not a Hindutva icon, that would be acceptable. He was not an ideologue. But it is egregious to claim that he was a Marxist secularist or a Muslim appeaser or anti-Hindu. If one views the happenings at the international arena in that stage of history, it must be said that Indian leaders did have a limited perspective. Following the 
Versailles Treaty, there was a rising trend of a new paradigm of internationalism, as it was termed, in opposition to the British American internationalism or the Anglosphere. Today, we chafe about Indian society and values being judged against inapplicable external parameters. We talk in general terms of dharma being incompatible with what is broadly termed as Western standards. These being the same as this British American internationalism. It is represented in international organizations like UN, dead yardsticks of human rights, equality, authoritarianism, etc. The Anglo-American model is what created conflict and poverty in third world countries, yet it uh, presumes to be working for the world's benefit. It was these impositions that were challenged by the anti-colonial and anti-imperialistic worldwide movement in the 1930s and 1940s, which unfortunately Indian politicians were largely disconnected from, both the Indian National Congress and those parties with a communal focus. Another international paradigm that existed was of course the communist uh, internationalism. But for obvious reasons and as Bose recognized, this was incompatible with the Indian ethos. Not that one couldn't uh, collaborate with it against imperialism, but it couldn't apply to India. And the Axis also had an uneasy alliance with it, though not strictly against. Japan and Germany were at the head of this wave of alternative internationalism. The Axis powers have been delegitimized, not on account of their being in the wrong and the allies being the paragons of humanistic ideals, but simply because they lost. Else, Churchill was no less a genocidal maniac than Hitler. And I don't mean to be a Holocaust denier with this, but he did kill equal number of Bengalis, my own people, as Jews in Germany. Hitler's explanation when Bose confronted him on his racist views in Mein Kampf is interesting. He said that he was including the German people among the dominated inferior people who had been enslaved because of their mindset and needed to rise and create a grander destiny for themselves by reimagining themselves as a superior people. We do the same when we talk about Aryan civilization, not reimagine but hark back to it. The essential difference being in the terms race and civilization. Hitler couldn't really talk of a 5000 year old civilization for obvious reasons. But were the Anglo-Americans not racists? They saw the Caucasians as a dominant race against inferior darker people. The Germans simply had a slightly different, somewhat more academic idea of race, even if flawed. Bose's lobbying with the German Foreign Office was effective enough to compel Hitler to explain himself, even if the explanation that he gave may have been more diplomatic than truthful. But contrary to what is portrayed by leftist liberal writers, Hitler did favorably consider the Indian interest and conveyed uh, Germany's clear stand on keeping India united against British machinations. He appreciated only too well the value of a united India, a greater India, because he had seen what had caused Germany's diminution. He was acquainted with the Austrian separatist movement and he eventually did take up Bose's plan of the Nazi forces physical approach towards India. People like Raj Bihari and uh, Subhash Bose conceived an India that was world historical in outlook and influence. In this sense, Bose found Savarkar's worldview limited. This very call given by Savarkar to Hindus to join the British Indian Army. The idea was, as I explained, to have a Hindu community with military training and temper that could uh, correct the deficient proportion of Hindus in the army. But it also shows that he was already thinking in terms of uh, partition. Then this decision to contribute to the British war effort, it was bargaining for limited gains, a dominion status. Since the Indian army was operating in an Anglo-American paradigm, 
the men were simply pawns. Remember, in return for this help, Indian leaders did not put any clear-cut condition before the British, that of total independence. They were just hoping that the British oblige in return for their help. They did not even insist on limits to the deployment of Indian army, even when the British were pushed in a narrow and disadvantageous negotiating space. They could have spoken against Indian soldiers being posted anywhere except in territorial uh, defense of India, like the Indian Independence League did. And Subhash Bose, who extracted the promise from the Japanese and uh, Germans respectively, that Indian soldiers would not fight in any battle except the Indian frontier. The Germans, by the way, kept that promise till the end, as also the Japanese, largely. If one reads about the sufferings of these Indian soldiers, so many thousands died without even an opportunity to fight. Many died during transportation in the holds of ships as POWs, caged in unhygienic conditions, succumbed to disease and hunger, officers as well as men. Bemot Maragai. When Bose met the POWs that Italy sent to Germany for the first time, they fell at his feet that we had not bargained for this. We wanted to fight for our country. Please get us out of here. And had the promise of being inducted in Indian Legion not been there, their fate would have been much worse. Bose chalked out a greater role for India, one that was not averse to alliances with Western powers, but on our own terms, unlike the way Indians got pushed into the Allied Alliance due to lack of nerve of Indian leaders to negotiate aggressively. The same so-called anti-fascist ideals that they pledged themselves to, where did it leave India? In spite of being on the winning side, that of the Allies, India ended up being carved up by the wily British. And what return has this condemnation of Japan and shedding tears for the Chinese nation brought us? The same China attacked you less than 15 years later and is eating you up bit by bit even now as we speak. This entire talk of decolonization that we have today is on account of this paradigm of internationalism, which continued after World War II simply since they were triumphant. The reason we are still stuck in it is because the Indian leaders lack vision. Cast के नाम पे अपने आप को जूते मारते रहते हैं हिंदू यही हिंदुत्ववादी लोग अब मैं आपकी बात का जवाब दूं तिवारी जी आपने कहा था ना कि in spite of being deeply Hindu in personal practice one can be anti Hindu just because Bose had opposed the Mahasabha इसका जवाब है कि in spite of touting Hinduism people can be anti Hindu and anti national in perpetuating the evangelist caste discourse appeasement politics creating factions among Hindus being tame pawns of the global Christian empire, as the great Hindutva party is doing right now. Those who virulently hate Islamism can also be anti-Hindu. Prime example is Ambedkar, who has been turned into a Hindutva icon today. The Dalitists are no less wild in their hatred towards Hinduism. Then the reformist incorporation, Arya Samaj, they may have been virulently anti-Islam, but they are against Hindu dharma, Janeo for all, Dalits as priests, untouchables for Vedas. Ye wahi colonial ideas hain, Hindu dharma nahi. And even Savarkar was a proponent of this kind of reformism. The so-called Hindu Thuvadis keep fomenting regional animosity, attacking the icons of other regions without a discomforted conscience. I call these guys the Rajiv Dikshitin club, jis vichar dhara ke tiwari ji pratik hain. Ye Bengali Vidvesh, National Anthem George V ke liye likhi gai thi, Dwarka Nath opium smuggler thai, Ram Mohan Roy Stooge thai, Rabindranath Tagore Muslim convert thai, ab to Swami Vivekanand ke virudh bhi shuru ho gaya. This Hindu unity on which the entire Hindu to ideology is premised, ye ek bhoot hai, jis ki sab baate karte hai, magar dekha ki zine bhi nahi hai ab tak. Aap Bipin Chandrapal aur Sharat Chandra Chattar ji ki baat zaroor kar rahe hai, अपनी अलबाई बनाने के लिए मगर उनके बारे में जानते आप कुछ भी नहीं बिपिन चंद्रपाल वाज नॉट एन आइडियोलॉग डिसकनेक्टेड फ्रॉम रियलिटी हिज व्यूज ऑन हिंदुइज्म एंड नेशनलिज्म एंड कम्युनलिज्म वर फार मोर नुआंस ही टॉक्ड ऑफ लिबरल कम्युनलिज्म एक्सट्रीम कम्युनलिज्म रिएक्टिव कम्युनलिज्म 
and competitive communalism and distinguished uh, all these from nationalism. He did not advocate mindless aggression, jeopardizing the nation for short-sighted marginal aims, a constant state of communal contention. Like for example, what Arya Samaj used to do, going and playing music before mosques, which incidentally triggered the 1926 uh, Bengal riots. What is the need of confrontational politics in a delicately poised communal situation and demographic equation? Bose and Chitranjandas were staunchly against Western ideas of progress and regress and their framework of economic and social development. Both talked of ancient models of governance, village level self-determination. Bose has been labelled as authoritarian by British writers, which Sitaram Goel happily buys. So how conducive is Goel's view to the Hindu nation and dharma? How is he any better than any leftist? Thankfully, Goel's diatribe in that uh, letter has been taken care of by Chandrachur Ghosh, so I will not have to go into it. It's a Sirf News article. Sitaram Goel trashed Netaji without studying Subhash Chandra Bose. I'd urge you all to read it. But it is amazing that Goel presumes to stand for Hindu India but repeats all the liberal uh, socialist leftist and imperialist claptrap against Bose. But one quote from Bose, there is much in his Hitler's organization worth studying, but as far as his principles are concerned, I do not see how they can appeal to India. On the economic side, he is more or less in the hands of big capitalists and politically he is pro-British. So Bose was very much aware of this. My general attitude towards European politics is that we should study closely all the latest developments, but at the same time, I firmly believe that India should evolve her own system in the light of her tradition and national requirements. I will earnestly, I earnestly deplore the tendency to reproduce in India the fascist and communist systems blindly. This should put paid to Sitaram Goel's ridiculous governments on both. Actually, Goel is the one knife, not Bose. Bose was not taken in even by those who helped him in the Nazi regime, like Adam von Trott, Wilhelm Kepler, and Franz Futwängler, who had hoped that Bose would be amenable to their liberal worldview, but were disappointed by his skepticism. Bose did not need to profess Hindutva. He was committed to bringing his nation to the greatest heights, through the light of her own loftiest spiritual traditions and experience.